it seems like uh, we had a service today uh, with a theme of thankfulness for many things that God have, has done for us. And although we're small in number, uh, there's a lot of things that we have to be thankful for. Uh, as we get into the, the sermon for the day, I think that uh, we can also see that the subject of our sermon today, uh, that person was, was very thankful. He was very thankful to God. I'm going to ask you if you would turn in your Bibles to Job. Job, the uh, first chapter and uh, verse 1. The sermon is entitled, God's Unfailing Love. God's Unfailing Love. Uh, I'm going to go through before the prayer for this sermon and read uh, our text for today. It starts in uh, Job 1.1. Job uh, chapter 1 verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Sounds like a pretty good person there uh, to me. And then we want to jump to chapter 2. And we want to read verses 1 through verse 10. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered uh, the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth at it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant they, uh, Jonah? I'm sorry, my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright and a man who fears God and shuns evil. And uh, he still maintains his integrity, though you incite me against him, to ruin him without any reason. Verse 4, skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and uh, strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Lord said to Satan, very well, then he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out uh, from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with uh, painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it, as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept only, uh, accept good from God and not trouble? Thank you, Father, for the lessons contained herein. I talked about thankfulness earlier. Job was a man who was thankful for you, to you for what you had done for him. Please help us as we study this. Open up our minds, Father, and help us to take it in so that we can worship you in the way that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, what a person Job was. Uh, going back to ch chapter 1 and reading verse 1, it says, in the land of us, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright, and he feared God and eschewed or shunned evil. Wow, that's quite a, 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 a reputation to have. Job was a man who lived in the land of us. It was believed that us was located uh, east of the Jordan River near Canaan in Israel. Remember, Canaan was the land that God promised the Israelites during the days of Moses and Joshua. And of course, the Jews were the people whom God first revealed himself to. So Job lived in that area. Job was not a Jew, but he probably knew about God because he knew 
God's people. They're in the land of Canaan. We talked about something a couple of weeks ago where a man who was not a Jew but followed God because he was around God's people. He learned, he understood, and he applied what God was teaching at that particular time. But that's the way Job was. The book of Job shows a good man suffering for no apparent fault of his own. And we see that in many areas of our society today. Good people suffering through no fault of their own. We see that good people suffering through no fault of their own. We maybe had an accident. It wasn't your fault. People are careless and things happen. Mistakes are made. The Bible itself says time and chance happens to all of us. We as Christians are not in a bubble. You know, it would be nice maybe if we had a Teflon bubble all around us and all the evil would just come, boom, and just bounce off. Time and chance happens to everyone. We live in a fallen world. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, if you be trust in Him, delivers them out of all of them. Of course, that doesn't mean we're abandoned by God because we suffer certain things. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned us at all. Job is shown here as a man who feared fears God, and shuns evil. Now, it doesn't mean that Job was sinless, because he wasn't. We see that in Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Does anyone have their Bible? I'd like for you to read the Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Anyone have his, have his Bible? Herb, do we have the mic? Sure, sure. Whoever wants to read it. I would like for someone to read that. Melanie's got her hand up. All right. Job 42, verses 1 through 6. I have the New Living Translation version. Um, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. He said, listen and I will speak. I have some questions for you and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Verse 6. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Thank you, Melanie. Job said, I repented. I talked about something I didn't know about. I was in error. So, yes, Job did sin, but... Job was human. Job practiced, nevertheless, what he preached. He had all of these good qualities, but one thing he did, he practiced what he preached. He was whole and balanced, a man of integrity. He was open. He was transparent. And he lived up to the understanding of God that he had. The understanding that he had of God, he lived up to. That's what it means when it says um, that he was blameless or perfect. 
He lived up to what he understood. What he understood. And I got to throw another word to my brother back here, Mr. Lawrence. You have nothing to apologize for when you stand up and do what you know according to what God says. You know, uh, you can compare that to a, a, a scientist or an astronaut or anything else. As long as you do, do what you understand God wants you to do, you are perfect in God's sight. Doesn't mean that you're sinless. That's the way God looked at Job. Yes, Job lived up to the understanding of God that he had. Verse 1 says that Job was upright. This relates to his relationship with others, being upright. Related to the relationship with others and means straight, faithful, loyal. He was a man of moral character. Taking the root words of upright and blameless or perfect together, you have the peak of human, of the, the peak of moral, human moral character. The peak of human moral character. You know, it would be great if a lot of people in our society today had human moral character. It amazes me, and I'm getting off of my soapbox right now, how politicians can stand for something when they were put in office by the people in their state to do what's best for them, but they want to do what's best for the party. You're going to have to forgive me, but that really rubs me the wrong way. That's not human moral character. I don't care what they say, this is what I want for me. Okay. That's not character. That's not the way Job was. It also says that Job feared God. This refers to a religious pers person. It refers to worship. Job was a man who actually worshipped God. He had a high and holy concept of God, and as a result, he hated evil. We're talking about a character here, a personality, and many of you have the same kind of personality and character that Job had. He shunned and av or avoided evil. As a result, God's fear, reverence, and respect for God he avoided and turned away from evil. He turned away from evil. Job's act of will turned aside from temptation and opportunities to do wrong. Re remember your attitude and my attitude when we first came to the church? There is nothing that people would say that would keep us from doing what we knew what was right. Like Marsha, we first came into the church, we had that attitude that, hey, this is what the Bible says and this is what I'm going to do. Well, that's the way Job was. Job, what a characteristic. What a personality. What much high respect for God that he gave his all to be for God 100%. Job was for God in God's way 100%. I stated earlier that the book of Job shows a good man suffering for no apparent thought of his own. Faith based on reward or prosperity is indeed hollow faith. Let me repeat that. 
Faith based on reward or prosperity is indeed hollow faith. This is what Satan was insinuating about Job. This wasn't the case with Job, however. To be unshakable, faith must be built on the confidence that God's ultimate purpose will come to pass. You can't see it right now. It doesn't seem apparent. But to be unshakable, faith must be built on uh, the confidence that God's ultimate purpose will come to pass. And Job, uh, Job knew this in the back of his mind. Job was the richest, was richer than anyone in the East. He was well known and the sage of the East. I'm sure many of you have read about Job. He was the richest man in that land. He was wise. He had friends all over. Let's jump to chapter 2, verse 1 to continue our text. Job chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Another day the angels came to present themselves before uh, the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Now, there was a day when the angels of the Lord came before God to present themselves before him, perhaps to give an account of what they had been doing. And behold, Satan shows up with them. And the Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan said, From roaming throughout the earth, from walking back and forth in it, seeking what I can do, seeking whom I might entice. Turn with me to a New Testament scripture, uh, 1 Timothy. Let's give you a little bit more light on that. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I want to read verses 14 and 15. So I counsel young old widows to marry and have children, to manage, the, manage their homes and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. Satan is looking for opportunities to discourage you. So he is talking to a certain area of the population and saying, you know, uh, well, I'm just, he's saying, uh, and he just happens to be talking right here to young widows. He says, so I, I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, and manage their homes and to give their enemies no opportunity for slander. Say this there. Any opportunity that he has to get under your skin, he's going to take it. And he says, um, so have in fact all, so have in fact already turned their way to follow Satan. He's there looking for the opportunities. Back to our text in chapter 2 of Job, verse 3, it says, And then God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? And then he goes into all of the good qualities that Job possesses as was mentioned in uh, verse 1 of chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 3. Then the Lord said uh, to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. Wow. You talk about the whole round globe. He said there is no one else on earth quite like Job. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incite me against him to ruin him 
without any reason. And then Satan challenges God. Verse 4 and 5. Skin for skin, Satan replies, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan was firmly of the opinion that Job was faithful only because of God's blessings. Satan believed that uh, Job was willing to accept the loss of his family and property as long as his own skin was safe. So, Satan's next step was to inflict physical suffering upon Job to prove his original accusation against Job. Back in chapter 1, verse 9, where it says, chapter 1, verse 9, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you, uh, Satan replied, have you uh, not put a hedge about him and his household and everything he has? Have you uh, blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herd are spread throughout the land? But now stretch out your hand and, and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. This was the first encounter. Everything that he has, so what? Satan takes all of his herds, his flocks, everything that he has. This, it says Job's wealth spread throughout the land. All of these, these herds, cattle that he had. Then he takes Job's children. Job had ten children, seven sons and three daughters. Satan took all of that. That was his first accusation against God, against Satan. I'm sorry, that was Satan's first accusation against God. God allowed him to take all of that. Now, this second accusation against Job, skin for skin, is even more insidious than the first. An ancient proverb is used here, skin for skin, which seems to imply that when it really comes down to it, man is so selfish and self-centered that he will always sacrifice Someone else is scared to save his own, even if it, even if it's his own family. What Satan is saying here is that all that a man has, he will give up for his life. But not so with Job. But then. Satan insinuates that Job's pious response was a fake attitude to stop the attacks while he still had his life and good health. We're in chapter 1. Look at verses 20 through 22. Chapter 1, verse 20. At this, Job got up. Now, this is after he had lost all of his possessions. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken. May the name of the Lord be praised. Well, that takes some, some character. Everything, everything is lost. Everything. Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked 
I will depart. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But Satan says, fake news, fake news, God. If you just get down to the nitty gritty of it, bring suffering to his body itself, he will curse you to your face. That's Satan. Fake news. Verse 6, chapter 2. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So God conceded. He accepted Satan's challenge. Not that Satan was in some way in charge, but God knew Job's character. Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. You are not to take his life. You know, brother, if God had allowed Satan to take Job's life, there would be no way to evaluate the effects of this testing of Job's faithfulness. But that wasn't important to Satan. All he wanted to do was to destroy. If that had happened, nothing would have been proven by this entire encounter. Satan, however, is not smarter than God. Job's suffering was a test for Job, for Satan, and for us today. It wasn't a test for God. So Job went from being the wealthiest man in the land to having lost his ten children, having lost all of his wealth, all of his physical possessions, all of his prestige in that community, to being an outcast, full of runny, pussy sores from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, that nobody wanted to be around. Sitting outside the city on a garbage heap, totally stripped of everything. All that Satan's desire. Just think, you've lost everything. That's total destitution. And he had everything probably hurting on his body, everything on his body except for probably the whites of his eyes. And then to have your wife come up to you, verse 9, while you are outside the city, sitting on a garbage heap, still maintaining your integrity to God and say, you need to curse God and die. You need to be out of this miserable situation. Now, let's fast forward to the day. Let's fast forward to the day. You are about to lose your business and your home, and you don't know what to do. And someone says to you, curse God. You have this serious health condition, and the doctors have done all that they can do. And someone says to you, what? Why are you still trusting God? Your family, 
your relatives and even your kids are so far from God and acting like pagans. And yet, you are still trying to maintain your holiness. Be upright before God. And someone says to you, give it up. Just give it up. Do you have the character and the stamina to stand up to them like Job did and say, you talk like a foolish person. Shall I accept good only from God and not the trouble that he might allow? Now, let me back up a bit. Was Job happy and living in a state of bliss with all that was happening? No. Verse 8 says that Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat on the ashes. What I'm saying, brother, is that we are not in charge. We live in an evil society, a fallen world, and there's also Satan's attacks against us. How about that? I put my pages in the wrong order. We also have Satan's attacks against us. We must make a commitment that our trust and our confidence is going to be in God. I want to read verse 9. I'm getting to the close of this now. Verse 9, it says, His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Really? All Job needed was someone someone's negative attitude around. That's all he needed was another, another negative attitude. Now, let me ask you at this point a strange question. Why was Job's wife spared from being killed when the rest of the family was all killed? Remember, they, they came in and, and they, they killed his Herds and then they, they attacked the family? Why was she still spared? Don't sell Satan short. short. Don't sell him short. Is it possible that her very presence caused Job even more suffering through complaining, bickering, and accusing God over all they had lost? Was she an attitude? Addition, was she an additional trial for Job, uh, Job to pass through? She seemingly was doing the very same thing that Satan was trying to do. Curse God. Was it Satan's desire to speak, to spare her life while the rest of the family was killed? Remember. Verse 1 says that Job feared and worshipped God. Despite all that had happened to him up to that point, Job did no evil with his lips. Verse 10, he replied, You're talking as a foolish woman. Shall I accept good only from God? and not trouble in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. He maintained his integrity. What about you in a situation like that? There are trials. We have trials ourselves. Our loved ones are going through trials. 
We have trials with our automobiles, our homes, our children, our family, everything. What about us? Are we going to remain committed to God despite all of that? God's unfailing love. Can we, can we skip ahead in this story of Job about 40 chapters? Job 42 verse 16. After this, Job lived, after this, Job lived 140 years. After being on the cusp of death, taking an old piece of broken pottery and scraping the boils to relieve the irritation and the itching, Job lived to be 140 years old. And he had an additional 10 more children and saw his children to the fourth generation. 10 more children and he saw them and their children and their children and their children. Four more generations. Yes. Chapter 42, verse 12 says, The Lord bless the latter half or the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. That's God's unfailing love. I can't believe that. His latter half was better than the first half. Can you imagine after God bragging on him and saying, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan did everything in his power to take Job out. God says, but spare his Life, and I'll show you. Wow, what a lesson. It's time for communion. <laughs> I know it's been a long day, but it is time for communion. And just think, brother, you and I have an opportunity to participate in God's unfailing love. It's here, and it's free. It's because of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, our Redeemer, and our Deliverer, who wants us, in the end, to experience the joy that Job experienced, but even more, in God's kingdom. I mean, that's what Job was working for. I'm game. Are you game to be a part of this? That's why we take part in communion, where we show our, a commitment of our trust and confidence in God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Savior. If it were not for the sacrifice, we would not have such a wonderful opportunity. Such a wonderful opportunity to experience the unfailing love of Jesus. And it doesn't matter who we are. There are the wealthy people, the higher echelon people that don't even have this understanding. But because we are Jesus's, we have that opportunity. We have an opportunity to take part in communion with Jesus says, I want you to do to remember me. Father in heaven, thank you for the sermon, the lesson of Job, who father of all the people on earth, 
was an example that God pointed to. And Father, we're not perfect, and we don't have to be perfect, and you don't expect for us to be perfect. That's why you took a very part of the Godhead and sent him to the earth, to earth, to die on our part, to be our sacrifice, to be our atonement, to sacrifice his life on our behalf. So we're so thankful, Father, and we can really go around in joy with our heads high, realizing the cost that was paid for each and every one of us. And as we partake, Father, of the communion at this time, that you said we need to do it on a regular basis, we pray that that bond between you and us will be even stronger. So as we take the bread and the wine, we ask your blessings upon it. And we pray that we can do it in great faith. Because, Father, it takes faith. It takes trust and confidence in you. We ask it all now. In Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen.